My name is Arun Dayanandan. I've met many of you uh, so far while I'm here in India. Some of you I've not yet met, if I haven't yet met you, uh, please come up after, me, after this talk and uh, introduce yourselves because I'd love to meet everybody at this wonderful institution. Um, thank you also to Arun for letting me give this talk and hopefully uh, you guys get something out of it. So let me know if, uh, at the end if this is helpful. So I'm going to talk about public speaking. Maybe I posted something on Instagram this morning. Maybe this reminds you of something I don't know. You can see uh, if, uh, what the theme of the, uh, the talk will be. You can give it a, give it a guess at the end. Um, but first, I just want to start with why, uh, well, why do we talk? Why do we give presentations in the first place? Manushree gave a really, really good one, a three-minute talk, and she touched on a lot of different things. And so I'm going to actually delve a little bit into that. I'll bring, it, bring that talk up a few times during this, uh, this presentation. So the reason we give talks is to connect with people, to engage, and to share curiosity. Um, we want to also help people understand what, what it is that we're, we're talking about, what we're working on, what it is our research, or something that in our personal lives. Uh, we want to demonstrate empathy. Empathy is a huge portion of the human experience. It's why we speak to people's values when we're giving a talk or when we're doing anything in the written word. Anytime we tell a story, we want to engage with people's values. Uh, we want to get people excited. I mean, talks are way more exciting than a lot of things out there. I mean, they're the one main way that we can connect with people on an intimate level, face to face. And, uh, and if you're excited, you can share that excitement with people around you. You can also share how convicted you are at changing the world and doing something about a lot of the things that we have around us. There's so many things to change in this world, and the fastest way to do so is to connect with people in every corner of this planet so that we can actually make these changes and to showcase just how determined we are. And that leads to action. Overall, this whole, this whole method of engagement leads to inspiration, inspiring people. It's why we do what we do. So hopefully you'll leave this talk inspired. And uh, if you're a little bit selfish, you know, we all are somewhat selfish. There's other reasons to give talks too. It'll help you build some confidence. If you're a little bit shy or scared of giving talks in front of people, it definitely has some career goals, uh, you know, building a career and a reputation within your industry and your field. Um, your, your network is a massive part of that. I mean, it's a big part of why here in India it's building that network. And so giving talks just like this one helps to develop that network so you can collaborate and, and build much larger projects in the future. And lastly, if you're going you know, towards the end of your career, um, it's, it's sometimes usually you'll see people will start thinking about their legacy and you know, what it is that they, they've left afterwards, what comes next. So there are some, some non-altruistic reasons to give, uh, give presentations uh, if you have the chance. So ultimately, what it comes down to is inspiring and connecting with people, or convincing people, or persuading them, narrating or informing them about certain topics, and explaining or revealing something. So these are the four main kind of presentations that you will ever give in your entire life. And so when you're giving a presentation, you want to ask yourself at first, which one are you doing? And then from there, you can see what the best structure to tell that story is. And I'm going to start with feeling. So the, the way we would actually structure this presentation is dividing it based on uh, how we are when we're giving a talk. Because once again, we're all humans. We have a number of shared emotions and a, sh a number of shared uh, circumstances. And so first, one of them will be how we feel when we're giving a talk. Also, if you guys have any questions during any of the portions, don't hesitate to, uh, to ask. I'm uh, more, than, more than happy to, uh, to answer questions at any time. So fear. There's something that uh, we can all relate to. It's something that I study. I scare fish back home um, and scaring snails here in India. So fear is a, is a universal. It's one of those things that's a great motivator, but it can also paralyze us. And one of the first things people ask when, they're, when they want to know, well, how do I give a presentation? I'm, I'm afraid. I don't know what to do. You know, when I get in front of people, I, I panic. You know, I lose the words. Everything gets caught up here. It's like I can't speak, can't breathe. Well, the first thing to do is, well, breathe. Uh, breathing and stretching, that goes a long way when it comes to easing those nerves. Eating something and drinking something, usually an hour before your talk, is very handy. Keeping something in your back pocket, like a granola bar or something, will also go a long way. Um, just making sure those basic biological needs are met and sleeping, that's a very important one, although I'm sure many of you know that somehow we manage to function and do our degrees without much sleep. Um, but sleeping is an important thing when you're giving, uh, giving talks. Uh, it also helps to have a backup plan just in case things don't work out in the sense you might want to keep some uh, note cards on the side, you might want to keep something in your, your pocket uh, that if worst case you, you kind of freeze up and have something to go back on. Um, 
actually just talking about the performance aspect. So I wasn't always very, very comfortable talking in front of people. Um, it surprised a lot of people because I tend to talk quite a bit now. But when I was in high school, I was terrified. It was like those words were getting stuck and I could not speak. It was almost impossible for me to actually present something in front of a group of people unless I'd practice and practice and practice and practice. Even then, you know, it, it would still, like, those nerves would get to me. What changed a lot though was that I also played guitar and I sang. And so I started playing open mic nights and performing when I was around 18 years old, when I was basically legally allowed to go to bars and, and present and do things. And so one of the things I would do is uh, those, those early stages was I would actually keep my phone or a piece of paper with the lyrics and the, the chords I had to play. And just in case I forgot something, I could, uh, I could kind of jump into that and, and see it. So I'd be playing and I had this thing as uh, a piece of paper right in front of me. Now, the the thing that really changed that, so having paper that, that works, having a phone and doing that doesn't necessarily work as well, so the phone would turn off. So halfway, this happened before, halfway during the song, I started forgetting the lyrics, and I look at my phone, my phone has just turned off, it's a black screen. I can't stop halfway through the song to, to try to, you know, scroll around and then find it, and so be wary if you're using any kind of technological or digital device, because that, those kind of things can happen. Um, but just going through that once was enough for, for me to really, you know, just figure out, okay, what to do? How do I just make my way, make my best out of the situation? Jugad, right? That's a term, right? Jugad here in, in India. So, you know, figure out what I can do in, in that circumstance. Um, and so these kind of things, it's, it's a small process. So it's not an overnight thing, but when you do little by little, that those kind of things help. Sometimes failing is actually the best thing to get rid of those fears. Another time I played an entire song, uh, I was playing with my, my friend, and I played it in the, the completely wrong key, about a half step down. It sounded awful, because when you play a half step down, nothing sounds like it's uh, in the same key. And so, um, you know, but halfway through the song, I realized what happened, so I bored the guitar, it was tuned differently, and so, quickly changed that. But again, you know, when, you, when I had this person come and scream in my face, um, clearly very, very drunk, this is the bar. And, um, and anyway, so once, once you go through that experience, it's a little bit easier. So fear is something not to be afraid of, ironically, but it is, it is uh, helpful. Um, and, but, and you can get, get through that. I will also say, no lecterns. I hate lecterns. I think they should all be burned to the ground. You know, they, those things that just stand in front of you, you can see the top of the person's head, you have a microphone here, and you have your notes, and all it encourages is people to hide behind and just read. And I think lecterns are awful. So do not use a lectern. They suck. Now you might be on the other side, you might be too relaxed. That could also be an issue, you know. Fear is a good motivator, as I mentioned. And so this I hope will give you some reasons of why you should be scared. Just a tiny bit, just enough to make sure that you, you're still kind of engaged in the material. When you're, when you're dealing especially with scientific topics in the field of conservation, for example, we're, we're dealing with a lot of different people and a lot of different ideas. And these ideas can be you know, skepticism, mistrust, you know, do they trust who you are? They might be trying to poke and make you look bad you know, mentally, that's always a possibility. They might just not like you, they might not, might not like the shoes you're wearing that day, maybe they're in a bad mood. Uh, boredom, that's just an ever-present thing, you know, people do get bored, you can't get everybody on board. Um, and especially when we're dealing with scientific uh, concepts, we're, we're dealing with things where we're taking information that isn't necessarily known by the average, uh, average viewer or listener and making it in a way that they can understand. But not everyone will understand. And so th there are some, some reasons you know, to, to try to maintain that engagement when you're presenting whatever that material might be, but especially when you're talking about science. Uh, fundamentally though, what it comes down to is just telling people you know, come along for the ride. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be great. Um, you're, you're leading people through this narrative, and um, that's all you can really do. And the people that want to pay attention, they will. There will always be some people that it's just not for them, and that's okay. All right, the look. I'm going to get you guys up on your feet. So if everyone can just stand up very quickly, because we're all, we're all sitting, so go ahead. We're going to, we're going to try this, this very gently. Posture is a big, big aspect of presenting and talking of things in general. Try first of all, let's try the, the figure on the left. Try slouching, you know, just, you know, you put your hands in your pocket, put your neck in, maybe, you know, if you want, you can cross your arms, you can know, look down, you know. It's, uh, it's a little bit hard, so, you know, it's a little hard to present a three-man talk or anything like that. Like this. You know, when, you're, when you're in this position, you know, you can walk around, but it's very, very hard, and, and our eyes are down, downcast, and our backs start to hurt. 
But that doesn't work, right? We know that. In many species, we see as well, actually, there's crayfish that, that when, when they're kind of beaten down by other crayfish, they just start to shrink down. And it's as a way of showing, you know, please don't attack me. I'm afraid. You know, I'm not a threat. Even large crayfish that could beat the other crayfish, if they've been beaten down enough, they'll just hide and they'll just give up. So this is a sign of giving up. And you definitely don't want to be doing this when you're giving a talk. OK, let's try the one on the right now. So I want everyone's, Amy Cuddy calls this a power pose. So everyone needs to stand up with your feet evenly distributed along your legs. If you want, you can put your hands by your hip, you know, the Wonder Woman pose or Superman. Um, yeah, no, exactly, exactly. You, know, you want to look up, you want to keep everything um, engaged. You want to even think of stretching your spine. Imagine there's a thread at the back of your head or the top of your head, and it's pulling your puppet. Right? So it's coming out. You want to roll your hips forward. Right? It's a little bit of a funny thing because you're kind of like thrusting forward. Right? Never thought I'd be doing a thrust for a group of people here in India. But basically, you go down, you roll your, your hips under. So your, your hips are forward, and your hands are out. And you want to make sure that you're, you're in an open position. And this, right off the bat, it opens up your, your diaphragm, it opens up your chest, and it means you can project your voice. So already, when you're this way, your diaphragm is cut off. You cannot talk. But when you open it up, you give all the space for all this air to fill up your lungs fully so you can project your voice. And that gives you the most the, the strongest voice, the more cl most clear voice you'll have. All right, I'll, I'll let you guys sit down. <laughs> <laughs> I love this, too, because Ruby, Ruby Khan is here. Last time at, at the conference in Sri Lanka, I got to pick on him. So now I get to pick on everybody equally. Um, <laughs> uh, one other thing, actually, I will mention, um, when you are giving a talk, and this really, really does help when you're going somewhere, is pick out a few people in the, in the audience that, um, that, I mean, that you know, or even if you don't know, that look like they're already interested in the material that you're giving. Um, you know, make eye contact with them, you might even say hello, uh, right before you're giving your talk, right at the beginning. And that just helps establish that rapport, it really helps calm those nerves. Um, the, uh, the eye contact thing is a huge part, too. Ideally, you want to be looking at somebody in the audience making eye contact at least once during every sentence that you say. It prevents you from essentially reading your slides or reading whatever you have with you, um, but it also makes sure that you have that engagement with the audience in front of you. All right, now how do we dress? How do we dress for success? The main rule of thumb here is you want to dress a little bit better than the people that are going to be in the audience. Now, Obviously, that was not the case today. I'm a little bit, uh, you know, maybe a little underdressed for the occasion today. But, um, but if you're if you're in the professional setting and you're giving a talk at a conference, you know, you might want to go for smart casual, generally the signs of the community. That's the way we dress. You might have some slacks, button-down shirt. Um, but if you you might be giving a talk at you know, one of the larger events, maybe you're you're working with fundry or with, uh, with donors, potential donors, with you know, seven million dollars in their pocket, and you've got to convince them that fish sex is the future of this planet, and you need to get them to pay for your research. So what do you do? Well, if I showed up like that, it might be a little bit hard. But if I show up in a suit, or at least you know, a little bit dressed, once again, to show that this is something I'm serious about, that message can get across a lot better. So you gotta think about who your audience is when you're deciding on what to wear. I've seen in many conferences sometimes, and not to pick on professors, but sometimes it's usually professors that do this. They tend to kind of underdress a lot. Um, they kind of, some, some of them I've seen look like they rolled out of bed. I once saw a professor at a conference, not you guys, don't worry, <laughs> that, um, that looked, uh, honestly, I thought that they had walked in, they were, they were homeless, but no, it turns out that they were a humanities professor. You know, they had the whole Darwin beard thing going on. Um, I guess that works like, in the that that's also, like, you know, sociology, they prefer Exactly. <laughs> well, that's exactly it. You have to think about the audience. So, you know, maybe that, that worked out in that conference in that setting, but, um, but it depends on the, on the audience. <laughs> Um, yeah, all the sociologists with their big beards. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, one thing to think about actually is if you're going to be filmed, make sure that what you're wearing does not have small patterns. They get really messed up on camera. Uh, also, if you might be mic'd up, if you're going to have a microphone, either an over ear microphone, do not wear earrings because they'll rattle against the mic. If you're going to be mic'd up with a lab mic that has a battery pack, the auditorium downstairs has one. Uh, make sure that you have something secure to keep it on, like a belt. The reason being that any time that moves, if it pulls on that wire, it's going to make a lot of noise, especially on the um, on the speakers. That will irritate the people in the audience. And if they're recording that, it's going to be very difficult for them to remove it after the fact. So just some more things just to keep in mind when you're uh, when you're giving a talk. Uh, so camera camera sign. Okay, so how do we make our slides look? Fun and fancy, and, and but still clear enough. So here's our blank canvas, just a nice little pure, uh, pure thing. I don't know what's going on there. It's like someone drew on a little person on the side of the screen. 
I don't know if that's a projector on the screen, but anyways. Um, <laughs> but um, this is our blank canvas. And uh, so first, let's say we have an image. This is actually the image we workshop over the past few days from yesterday. We have about 18 people, I think, total. If somebody taking a picture. Um, at the workshop that I gave uh, the past two days on, on scientific communication. Um, so say I want to make a talk, I want to show, showcase what, you know, hey, look at these cool people here. Um, generally, you want to make sure that your picture takes up the entire screen, if you can. Now, there's two black bars, that's just, a, that's just the computer, but in the actual slide and presentation is the full screen. Um, if you're going to use a group photo, by the way, make sure you just stick to one group photo. Um, you don't want, especially in science, like we want to thank everyone, but sometimes if we, have, we, we work with so many different people, having 800 group photos sometimes can get overwhelming, especially because I recognize that, well, maybe this case might be different because we're at the same institution, but oftentimes we'll have no idea who those people are on the picture, so it's more of just like a thanking thing as opposed to information for the audience. Um, but now if you have this picture, um, make sure there's a, there's a black background here. If, you want, if it's quite small, usually use a black background for a photo. It makes the photo pop out a bit more. Uh, the next thing you want to make sure is you have attribution. You have the right to show that. Presentations are very, very, very neat, especially academic presentations, because I'm not making any money out of this, and which means that it helps to define fair use principles. So I can use things that are copyrighted because um, it's an educational purpose, it's nonprofit, um, and I'm not distributing this on. Um, outside of this, essentially, this room. Um, so, but, but when you are making presentations, depending on where this presentation is going, it's something to keep, <coughs> keep in mind, especially if you're gonna be giving it out. Now, another useful tip is whenever you have a lot of things to say, you don't want things behind you. You can be very distracted. So for that reason, put up a black screen. You know, there's no harm in that. So that way people, are, all their energy and their focus is on you when you're talking. You can then move from there into your next bit of information, the next slide. And maybe your slide is gonna have some text. So the first thing you wanna make sure is have a lot of contrast. So black on white is great for contrast. You wanna make sure that people all the way in the far back can see what you have on, on the slide. You also want to make sure that you are adding points one at a time, especially if those points are fairly unrelated. You might have noticed earlier on in the talk I had a lot of those points at once, but the reason for that is because I wanted you to see them all at once for the entire duration. Um, whereas here, each one is a separate point, that's where you want to make sure that you're introducing the point at a different time than the, uh, the individual. Uh, you, know, you, you want to show each point separately uh, along with how you're explaining it. You also want to make sure that you are using only three fonts maximum, absolute maximum in your entire presentation. This is not 1994 or 1995 anymore. Word art is a no-go unless you have an express purpose for that, and even then it's very rare. Um, it's, be it's better to tend to, uh, to choose one of these kind of fonts, so Helvetica, Arial, or any sans serif font. Something without too much fancy you know, movement around it. Unless, again, it tells your narrative or it adds to your story. You do not want bullet points. You might have noticed that I've removed all the bullet points. They're just distracting and very unnecessary. Bullet points are for lists that you see that you might write as a note form, but for a presentation, you don't want those bullet points there. You also want to avoid underlying things. That might help for, uh, for an actual report, but once again, for a presentation, we don't want underlining or uh, italics. Uh, italics become very difficult to see, especially the further you get, so it's best to avoid those. If you want to emphasize something, use bold. All right, so now moving into how we sound, so the actual meat of the talk or the meat of a presentation. You want to ask yourself what your, uh, what your story is, and one of the best ways that you can explain a story is by talking about your own journey. Now, if you haven't realized it yet, the theme of this has been Iron Man, um, and I use that for a reason. I think Iron Man is an incredible example of storytelling done right. I mean, not only did it make a great movie, the first one, um, although I like the other ones too, it also launched an entire franchise, right? It launched something that, uh, that spanned for, it's still ongoing, but spanned for over 12 years before you know, the Iron Man saga actually came to a close, right, Endgame. Um, using real, now when you're talking about your own story, you want to try to use real facts and, and anecdotes from your life. Again, it's about connecting with the listener. And uh, the main thing to think about is, is a takeaway. So what is it that you want? What is one thing, only one thing, that you want the, the, the viewer, the listener, the audience to take away from your talk? And um, the best way to approach that is similar to the statement at the beginning, you know, you're, you're guiding them through a talk. So you're the tour guide. What is the main thing that you want to show or share with them? 
The way to choose what that main thing should be is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This is, these are the main needs of everybody on this planet. In fact, many of these are for every animal on this planet as well. Um, so actually talking about Manushree's talk at the ending, she asked about how she ended. So one of the things I noticed was she ended with children, children in the future. These are things that most people can relate to. You know, it's on that, that hierarchy. It's something that fits within our, our love, sense of love and belonging. Um, and also, it speaks to our self-actualization. We want to know who we are. We, when we think of the future, we don't think of ourselves like, you know, in five years, I think I'm going to be homeless. You know, I think that'd be all right. Um, it, it's very rare that we think. We, we, we tell ourselves stories because we want to, to, to be the main character. We are the main character in our stories. And that can get very, very philosophical, but I'll leave that whole discussion for the people with big beards. Um, so, so Maslow's hierarchy, if you follow the, the physiological needs, that idea of safety, love and belonging, or family, so a person's self-esteem and where they get their motivation from, and their, uh, their, their idea of self-actualization, so where they fit in this planet, and amongst everyone you know, as a social organism, uh, you will, you will you know, hit the nail on the head when it comes to choosing what values to share with people. Uh, another thing I should mention is you should aim for one person. So when you're thinking of, of the values, Everyone is so different. I can, I know if I, if I split this room in half, the values on this side of the room, while, while they will come from there, they might still be a little bit different than the values on this side, in the sense that maybe the people here value family more and the people here value self-actualization more. You know, things change based on age, they change based on gender, they change based on any, anything that really makes us who we are. Um, so the best thing to do is really pick who it is that you want to talk, like, talk to. Think of one person specifically and what they value and target to them. You'll, of course, get many people, but you want to just be aiming at one in your mind. So don't think of demographics. People don't like to think of themselves as part of a demographic. We're all individual snowflakes. Um, now, structuring a talk. So structuring a talk is similar and a little bit different than the way we structure a writing. With a writing, you have a person on your page. You have to be there. With a talk, there is a level of engagement that, that, that's there, and we can, we can remember things and always look back on things when it's in the written word. We can't do that in a talk. And so there's a few ways we can, we can structure a talk. The first one is by introducing a problem, giving a personal anecdote. Once again, we want to talk about our story. Um, but oftentimes, and you'll see this a lot in TED Talks, they'll talk about how things didn't work at first, and then move on to what their thing did, how it did work. And then they'll talk about the future. Again, it might be children, it might be you know, the, the future of the planet, it could be the future of you. Generally, that's a good structure to stick with. And you'll see that, in fact, most, most stories do fit with structure. When we look at the way we write a scientific paper, we can naturally fit that into that structure. The way the introduction is written, that generally fits into the intro to problem. Anecdote, we tend not to use anecdotes in, in scientific writing, but it is kind of like an anecdote in the sense that we're talking about what's happened. And we talk about the failed attempts in the sense of, here's what's happened, here's what hasn't been looked at, or here's where the controversy is. And we fit that into there. You might then move into your actual experiment, and that's where your proposal slash new evidence comes in. And from there, you'll talk, once you've you know, done your experiment, you then talk about what, why it matters. How does it fit into that big picture, and what are the future implications of it? Is it going to save all the children? I don't know, maybe, but if we convince someone to pay $7 million for it, that's all that really matters at the end of the day. You have to think about what the purpose of your story is. So one thing to ask, or one way to frame that is, what, so what, now what? Now, so what was there before? Why do we care? And now what are we doing? What's the future of this? And this really fits into uh, the, the three-act narrative. I went, you know, I, I go into that with the, the other workshop, the science communication workshop, at much greater, greater depth. But fundamentally, this is the way you know we like to tell our stories, and this is the way we might want to look at the way we uh, we talk about our stories, or we present oral oral narratives. So when you take those narratives again, it's storytelling. We come out to three major types of stories that we see. So first, there are the detective stories. Um, those kind of detective stories are very common in science. We talk about you know, what someone else might say, what, what, what does the other side say first, and then we add our narrative or our story to that. It might be the revelation story, the revelation story being the actual process of revealing slowly how we got to a specific place. Uh, we don't do that generally in, in a conference presentation when we're talking about our experiment, but this might be you know, something like a much smaller communication, or if you're telling the story, once again, to funders and, and things like that. We want to tell how we got to where we did. In fact, the world is moving towards these kind of stories. It's why blogs are so popular. It's why we like Twitter and, and Instagram, because we want them behind the scenes. We want to see how is it that this person that created this amazing thing got to that position in the first place. 
And finally, we have a demo story. The demo story is essentially, I'm excited to show you blank because it will change blank, right? I'm excited to show you this new species of frog because it will change the way you know, conservation works and you know, we should be focusing on the, the, the conservation of species because we want our children to you know, value them or see them or live in a world where these are present. So the demo story is another way of doing it. Oftentimes, the demo stories work very well when you have a product to show. This is where we actually say, I invented this thing, and I want to show you how this fits into the world and how it will help you. The next, uh, next thing I want to talk about, this is a little bit nice little garage band picture here, is, uh, is how we actually speak. That's a, that's a big part about uh, well, communication in general. So there's many aspects of speaking, and it's very easy to think about it as, a, as an instrument. The, the human voice is an instrument. Even if you're not singing, it has every element that you can find in, uh, in song. And there's a reason why songs really do, do hold a strong place in our culture and across all cultures. So first we'll talk about volume. Volume is just the loudness. You know, how loud do you, do you speak? Do I whisper everything that I'm saying? No, I'm sorry, I can't say. Or do I actually project my voice so that it gets the back through and everyone can hear this, right? So you want to make sure that you're, you're speaking at enough of a level that everyone can hear, but we don't want to be shouting everything because it becomes way too much, right? And, it, and it, so it, everyone kind of feels a little bit awkward, it's like, ah, you know? So <laughs> loudness is a big one. The pitch at which you speak at, you know, this is a natural thing that fits. Everyone has their own pitch that they, they speak at. But we might tend to increase our pitch when we're speaking to a group. We might even lower our pitch. And that really helps when you have that open chest again when we're speaking from our diaphragm. The reason being that when you project, you start to naturally get the pitch that where you speak best at. Um, it's, a, it's a difference between listening to, I don't know if you guys have a similar show here, like American Idol back home, where you hear like the, the singer who just does, does not hit any of the notes, or just sounds so awful because she's like, he or she is straining versus the one that just feels like they, they just hit it perfectly, it's because they might be singing at a pitch that's either too high or too low. So you want to make sure that you're, sit, you're sitting at where you normally are comfortably speaking at. We want to talk about timbre. Timbre is essentially another thing that fits within when you have that open way of speaking. It's our natural way of, of talking. So like just as every instrument can play the same note but have a different sound, you know, a piano playing a C major, a scale, and a uh, what do you call it? A trumpet playing a C major scale sound completely different, um, just despite the fact that they're the same note, the same pitch. That's what we call timbre. So everyone has a natural timbre to their voice, and it's always good to, to work that. So making sure that you stay within your timbre is the important part. Tone. Tone is essentially the quality at which we speak. Um, so if if you're really raspy or if you're you know big and open, um, that's something to be conscientious of when you're when you're speaking. You know how your voice fits into the rest. And uh, we also have the pace. So pacing is, do I quickly you know, run through everything, or do I pace by myself? Um, and so, you know, obviously <coughs> there's two extremes, right, to that. And uh, we want to make sure that we, we fit within a certain pace. And that's a, that's a natural thing. I'm a very excitable person, in case you know. This is how I talk to people in general, for better or for worse. And it can be overwhelming, I understand that, for, for some people. Um, but but that's just how I naturally naturally speak in general. When I'm excited about something, I, I really get amped up about it. But you might have different ways. Maybe you get like, oh yeah, like you know, you, you like open up your, your voice, your timbre might change, your pace might change because you get you know everything. So it's really just about how you communicate your passion, and that is what's going to change and determine the best way for you as an individual to uh, to control these uh, the way you speak. The last one is prosody. It's also the musicality of the way you speak. Um, the best way to think about this is if you're asking a question, it'd be really weird if I asked and said this you know, at the end of every sentence. It'd be, it'd be really bizarre, right? Because we expect the, the increase at the end of a sentence to be associated with a question. But this happens throughout our natural speech no matter what, whenever you're speaking. So thinking about that, that musicality and where you emphasize is a big part of actually getting the information across. I speak very quickly and I'm very excitable. But the thing is, and this is something I've learned over years, is that information still gets across because I'm putting the, the, the inflection and the emphasis on specific portions of, of what I'm saying, and that's not by accident. Um, one thing, actually, I wanted to mention about the musicality. Oh yeah, actually, make sure that the best way to do this is record yourself. Either record yourself on video, as I, I often do that whenever I'm giving a talk. It's really for me to be able to look back and see how that's changed over time and to, Essentially, I do all this, and every time I give a talk, I always look at how I've done it, what I can do better. Um, again, it's like, like Madhushik was saying about 
the blog writing or writing in general, you want to have some way to, to, to judge or see what you've been doing right in the past. Um, and so for me, that's recording it and then revising it and then listening back to see what I can change. And uh, garage band works for that kind of thing. I mean, anything, any way to record. All right, the lectern again. Why is the lectern here? It's mainly for me to say, don't ever use a lectern. Um, time yourself when you're recording, give a talk. Uh, Tony Stark does not use a lectern. In fact, he eats cheeseburgers, gets in front of people, right, and you know, eats a cheeseburger while telling everyone he's an Iron Man. There's a reason for that. There's a reason they film that scene like that. Because there is this, this differentiation between people. They want you as, a, as an audience to connect with the fact that he's just, he's an awful person. I mean, the way it starts, I mean, he's, he makes his money off of killing people, right? And then that, this big change, he goes from this like really greedy, you know, uh, I'm, I'm the center of the universe person to, you know, the whole, I'm not going to end it obviously, but the, the whole, you know, um, character arc and redeeming and finding himself. And, but one way they have you connect with someone who's clearly not a very nice person is making him, you know, actually come out from the lectern and, you know, be, you know, as one of the people. He sits down, right? I mean, that's something we don't really see. Why would this big, you know, enterprise, you know, running person come out and just front and sit down eating a cheeseburger and telling you about what they've done? That automatically establishes that connection with people, right? So forget lecterns. Um, the other reason I want to say that in the sound section is because that changes the way you present, the way you communicate. If you're behind a lecture, you will communicate very differently than when you communicate when you're speaking in, the, in your voice when you're in front of people. So, again, to, to, to make sure that that point is driven clear, not to use lectures, I would rather watch you washing dishes than watch you behind a lecture. And there's a reason I say that. The reason I say that is because you should be able to give your talk while doing something completely unrelated. That's how you know you're pre prepared and that you're ready to give that talk. If you can speak at double speed and give that talk, and if you can do something completely different while, while presenting that material, you're, you're ready essentially to give that talk to anyone. It's something that we do in the music world when you're singing. They say you're ready to perform when you can sing a song while you know doing yard work, right? or washing dishes, or whatever it might be. Um, <laughs> and, and the same thing with the double speed. Generally, especially people that are working uh, on a speed technique based uh, instruments, if you're like short guitar, like you know, prog rock or something, you generally play, you, you learn to play at a much faster speed, and then that way you can dial it back and it feels much more comfortable. Uh, it's the difference between jazz music and classical music. When you see a good classical musician, we're really just looking at how well they played the piece as it was written, right? It was perfect, everything is structured, ah, oh, this person sounded exactly like Mozart, okay, cool. Um, and that might be your thing. So if that's your thing, you want to make sure you, you practice and present. The other way to look at it is like jazz. And jazz is very improvisational. You know, we might have 10% of the, the, the structure already in place, but everything else that fits in between is really just conversation. And personally, I think that works way better for, uh, for, for a presentation, for a talk. Uh, just actually fitting in on that, when, when I'm mentioning this idea of improvising, uh, one way to look at it, actually a very good way to prepare your presentations is speak it first, no, without even having any slides. Think about what you want to say and record yourself talking. You can do it on your phone. The way you naturally speak will automatically help you structure the way you're going to present. If you're trying to present something that you don't naturally fit into, it becomes a lot harder. But if you're presenting something that you were naturally, you know, you were going to kind of say that method anyway, it will come out a lot easier and you can very, very, you know, you can just make it a conversation with the audience. Okay, things to avoid. We're almost done here. There are a number of things you want to avoid. Uh, puns and sarcasm, it might work, you might be a very sarcastic person, depends, it's very culturally dependent, some cultures, Canadians especially, we love our sarcastic humor. Um, it sounds like we're awful people sometimes, and then we say sorry all the time, but in reality, we swear we're not doing it out of malice, it's just that that's the way our, our humor is, we like to go fun at people, just out of you know, good nature fun. But when you're in front of people giving a talk, there's many people from different cultures, it doesn't really fit the same way. So puns and sarcasm, I'd avoid them, they're kind of dangerous territory. Jargon, especially in academia and science, do not use jargon. Aim your speech or aim your talk to someone who is in, ideally, at a high school level, right, and that kind of the kind of vocabulary you would have used in high school, or even at a sixth grade level, depending on the way you're giving your talk. If that jargon or that specific term is absolutely necessary to what you do, define it every single time. The reason being that nobody, even, even if people already know that material, nobody wants to, to have to kind of 
it's just difficult. It's difficult to stay awake when something is very jargon laden, right? We prefer things just to be spoken in a natural manner. And many of these terms in academia and science in general, no one uses in their day-to-day -day life as a normal way of communicating. Don't, uh, don't show off uh, and don't name drop. No one really cares. Unless, actually there's one exception, if you're at a community event and you are presenting uh, because someone invited you to present there and that person is well known in that community, then it's okay to thank them at the beginning or thank them at the end and to mention them, but only if everybody knows this individual or most people know this individual. So, you know, someone like Bill Gates, if you go to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for example, but that depends on your, your place. Uh, you also want to be focusing on you. Uh, sorry, focus, do not focus on you, focus on your ideas. Um, once again, you don't want to be telling stories to show off, but more than anything, you want to be congruent, right? You want to make sure the way you're speaking fits with who you are as an individual. We, we as humans, we can identify incongruency. Incongruency meaning, you know, whether your, your nature matches with the way you're presenting yourself. You know, we're very, very, um, we're, we're very, very suspect of people where that, in which that doesn't match. So whenever you have that feeling, hey, something, that person is a little bit sketchy and we can't really put our finger on it, it's usually because they're not, something about them is not congruent with the way they're, they're, they're portraying themselves. Um, and so that kind of fits with, with this once again. Uh, I mean, Tony Stark is, this is again, this, this is like from the first scene in the movie, right? And once again, I think this is the, the greatest way they could have introduced a character. I mean, just as this, this picture alone tells you everything you need to know about Tony Stark, right? I mean, Robert Downey Jr. plays an amazing, you know, does this role amazingly well. But, I mean, you can see there's explosions in the background, he's got his arms wide, he's got basically a power pose, right? And he's just stone faced, like that, the, the massive explosion in the background did not phase him whatsoever. Right? So you know all these things about you, about him. So it's congruent. We may, you know, you're technically not supposed to like him. Um, Iron Man as a comic was actually invented originally uh, by Stan Lee and was it, I think it was Jack Kirby? I forget. Anyways, Stan Lee and the other person. Um, and he was made actually to be a character you hated. They wanted to see if they could make someone that was truly just appalling and make people fall in love with the character. And they did a phenomenal job with that at Marvel, especially you know, with the movie, but even before the movie, with the comics, people loved Tony Stark, despite the fact that he was designed for you to hate him. But it's because he's congruent. You know what you're getting. You know you're getting him essentially a sociopath, right? Um, or what's a billionaire playboy philanthropist? A genius billionaire playboy philanthropist? You know what you're getting right out of that. Um, okay, so last little closing part. Actually, I'm gonna close the opener. Scripture opening, scripture closing. It always helps. Once you get into that, that method of the way you're presenting, things are a lot easier. So if you know what you want to say at the beginning, and you know what you want to say at the end, you improvise the middle, and things will make a lot more sense. A lot easier to make that presentation. Uh, say the acknowledgments for later. Once again, no one, there's no need to start, unless you can say it like this. No need to start the, the talk with a thank for everyone. Very quickly, you can say, well, thank you for, the, you know, for inviting me to give a talk, and then you jump into it. But it's usually better to do it at the end. Uh, the, way, the way you want to start, and actually, Manushu just did that with her talk. What was the, what was the way you introduced it? It was, uh, you, you introduced your story with a fraud, with intrigue. And I can't remember, there's a way you did it, but it's okay. But essentially, she did a phenomenal job with that. And the way she did that was, she got you thinking. It was like a, it was like, oh, make it a big Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe, but I wouldn't forget that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, <laughs> So now you're learning from me, putting people on the spot, eh? Yeah. <laughs> um, next time, next time, we'll, we'll get her. Um, yeah, so, so you want to start with something surprising, you want to start with some way to get the person kind of asking themselves that hook, you know, what, what, what's, what's next? So that's a way, that's a way to make a good opener. What, ask, ask yourself what you can ask the audience, which will make them naturally want to find out the answer. Um, and uh, yeah, and then the last thing I should want to say on this slide was, if your talk was a movie, how would you open it? I mean, personally, I think that's a phenomenal way to open any talk, I would think. I mean, I would love to walk out one day and be like, yeah, this is how I'm going to open my talk. But, you know, <laughs> it's a good way to think of it is, if this talk was a movie, what's the best way to open it? If that really does fit into the way you tell that story. Now, when you're thinking of your ending, how you're gonna finish your talk, you wanna think about a few things. There's many ways you can end it. You can end it with a bigger picture, you know what's gonna happen next. You can talk about a call to action, get people to do this, give me money, you know, support my cause, come out on this day, get people to actually do things. 
You can end with a personal commitment. Elon Musk does a great job with this. If you look at his talks, he ends his talks with um, essentially, what is it? He says, he, what he goes into is basically says that regardless of whatever just happened, whatever circumstance happens, he's personally committed to getting you know, that result. So the thing when the first, uh, before, I think before SpaceX, but when their first launch failed and they just lost their, their, their ship, he was essentially saying, this doesn't phase me, I'm gonna make sure that we, you know, we re-land this thing. And just saying that, having that personal commitment can get people on board because people like driven people. People like to work with people that have their goal in mind and are gonna get to that point no matter what. Another way to go into it is with your values and your vision. Once again, it's similar to Elon Musk, but this is a great example of values and vision is with, uh, with Steve Jobs, right? His the way he would give his talks, especially at the Apple keynotes, is he would talk about what his vision for the future is. You know, here's this thing, what is the world gonna look like when I have this thing out there? And that can include your science as well. You know, what does the world look like when, you, when, when people have done what I've just presented, what I'm asking of you? This really fits in well with the call to action. And finally, narrative symmetry, coming full circle. And we wanna make sure that we're ending in a way that relates to what we've started with, you know, that we haven't gone on too far of a tangent. And a good way to do that is if you started with an anecdote, returning back to that anecdote and talking about how the things in the middle, what you just presented, change the meaning of that anecdote of what you spoke about earlier at the beginning. And that's just a natural way to bookend a talk. Now, even if you don't do all of these things, there's many different ways to, to end. Um, one thing to make sure you don't keep trailing is really just end with a thank you. So with that, thank you. <laughs>